Hello everybody, so today we're looking at um, chemical reactions and this is a big section in chemistry, uh, a very big section in chemistry in fact. So when I'm doing this I teach the gist of chemical reactions, the rates of chemical reactions and also the energy in chemical reactions together. I prefer teaching them together because well, they're, they're so interwoven with one another that you can't really treat them separately. Um, so I know some textbooks will treat them separately, but I feel that they go better when they're all interwoven together. Now, before I move on, just a quick reminder there that if you look on the Conacher flask on the experiment section on the Junior Cycle Science there, you'll see that there's a booklet there for, um, for all experiments, in which there is quite a few of these um, experiments in this chapter, especially for the rates and the factors affecting it. Um, so please look at those and pay particular attention to the diagrams and the graphs and obviously the um, the results um, with those graphs. Now I divided this video lesson um, into five different sections. One is just the gist of chemical reactions and we'll look at an exam paper question too. Another one is successful collisions and then the rates of reaction and then move on to the energies of um, chemical reactions then. Okay so let's get started with chemical reactions. So this came up last year, I think it did, 20, it did actually, because it's the only year that it came up in. And this actually came up in the state exam. So students were asked to count the number, for reading here, of each type of atom in the products to complete the table below. And they're told the elements, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, and what they correspond to, that's grand. And then um, they're also told the number of, of atoms in the reactants, 1, 4 and 4. And now they're asked for the number of atoms in the products. Well, the law of conservation of mass states that matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So this, in other words, there should be the same number on either side. And we could double check this. So let's just go back up here. We're looking for the products here. So how many big yellow um, circles do we have over here? We only have one. Okay, so we put down one over here. Next one. Um, hydrogens, we're looking for how many of the, the blue circles over there. So we count them up. One, two, three, four. So we have four here. And then we go again and we count up the red um, circles there. We have one, two, three, four. So it's the exact same as the, um, as the number of atoms in the reactants. Now, mass is conserved during this reaction. What evidence is there for this? Now, this caught a lot of students because what they would have learned off, they would have learned it off as there would be the same number of atoms in the reactant side as there is in the product side. Like that's what I would have said. But in the state exams um, of 2019, and they marked that incorrect. Students had to say it exactly like this. Same number um, of type of atoms in reactants and product side. Something along those lines. The key there was to use the word type. So the same number of type of atoms um, in the reactants and the product. Okay, that's the only thing that they were accepting. They were very rigid with this, okay? So you had to use the word, um, have the word type in it. And obviously the same number of them. So basically the same um, number, type of carbon atoms either side. Um, and again, oxygens were there and hydrogens were also there. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing. Um, and it's not something I particularly liked myself, um, but that's what they were looking for. So look, we'll, we'll know what to say in the future. So for successful collisions here, now I put this in um, just to, um, to help us along with us. Okay, so all reactants need to collide successfully with one another to form a product. In other words, you have your two reactants here, methane, CH4, and oxygen gas, O2. And unless they have enough energy, they have to collide off each other. And unless they have enough energy, they are not going to form these products over here. So they're really, really strict with that, okay? All reactants need to collide successfully with one another to form a product. Okay, so particles in a container usually move, 
okay, as they are generally in a liquid or a gas a gaseous state. So that means they can um, they can flow as what part of one of the properties of the states of matter. Solids we don't really include simply because when we do chemical reactions, we're usually heating up something, okay, uh, which then converts us if we heat up anything uh, with enough temperature, enough heat. Um, we convert it from a solid into a liquid and then into a gas, depending on how much heat we apply. So these par particles are moving, okay, and they hit off each other. But if they are to form a product, then they need to have enough kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, and you'll learn this when you do energy in more detail in the physics chapters, is just movement, okay, how people move and so forth, okay. Like, so, um, um, there'll be a lot of there be high intensity in terms of kinetic energy in um, ballet dancing or um, Irish dancing or something along, something along those lines. Um, the Xbox um, brought out something called the Xbox Connect, which involved people having to move to um, to play the game or whatever. So the, these particles, the reactants, hit off each other, but if they are to form a product, they need to have enough kinetic energy. Otherwise, they simply bounce off one another. Okay, so for a successful collision, these particles here need to have enough kinetic energy to form the react or the product particles up here. Okay, let's move on. Now, this is a big enough slide um, or part of it. Okay, and I put it all there together just to, um, just for you to see it um, the whole way through. So the rate of reaction and the factors affecting it. First off, what is the rate of reaction? It is the change in concentration per unit time. Guys, you need to know that definition off by heart. There's no getting around it. Okay, and you have to have it word perfect. The change in concentration per unit time. That's really, really important. Now, there are five factors affecting us. I have four here. There's another one here, the catalyst underneath there. I'll discuss that in a second. Okay, so I'm going to go through each of them. Particle size. Well, small particles have a large surface area, meaning they can react faster. To give you an example, now this is not an example of a chemical reaction, but it's just um, an example of how particle size plays um, a part. So imagine you're at home and you're cooking, uh, you're, you're boiling some potatoes. Well, you should know at this stage now that if you cut the potatoes in half or into quarters or whatever, they're going to cook a lot faster. Or boil a lot faster okay and then they're, they soften um, and the reason being is they're going to be smaller okay then uh, and because they're smaller they have a larger surface area that means they react faster now the boiling of a potato is not uh, a chemical reaction there okay so just be just to bear that one in mind but it is a nice um, example to use an analogy to it a concentration so well the more particles present, the more likely a successful collision will occur, that they'll bounce off each other. So the more of them that's there, yeah, the more likely it's going to happen. Um, the nature of reactants, well, you need to learn this one off, and this ties in with chemical bonding. So that just states that ionic chemicals react faster than covalent chemicals because no bonds need to be broken. In covalent chemicals or compounds, and uh, whatever way we want to describe them, okay, there is... Um, they, they're sharing their electrons and there is bonds formed they're quite rigid so they need to be broken before um, the chemicals can react whereas in ionic substances they, this doesn't have to take place okay um, so ionic substances react faster than covalent chemicals because no bonds need to be broken and finally temperature well not finally um, our fourth one I should say temperature if we increase the temperature this causes the particles to move faster therefore increasing the chance of a successful collision. Okay, so remember what I was saying about up here, about um, kinetic energy. Well, by heating up the particles, you're giving them, you're, you're increasing the kinetic energy. And the more kinetic, the kinetic energy they have, the more likely they are going to collide successfully. So temperature... Increasing temperature causes particles to move faster, therefore greater kinetic energy and more likely for a su successful collision to take place. Now, we're coming up towards the last of us here really, um, and this is going to tie in with our energy in um, our energy profile diagrams in a second. So a catalyst. A catalyst lowers the activation energy. 
and therefore speeding up the rate of reaction. Now, what exactly is the activation energy? Okay, so I have the activation energy over here. So, it is the minimum, and this is important that you use the word minimum, and I can't stress that one enough, amount of energy colliding particles require for a successful collision to occur. So, I said early on up here, and it always comes back to this um, part of the year, that they need to have enough kinetic energy for them to collide successfully, and therefore to form a product. Now, the activation energy is this energy, essentially. It is the minimum energy that these colliding particles require for a successful collision to take place. Okay, so all chemical reactions have something, um, have um, an activation energy. And if you add in a catalyst, okay, it speeds up the chemical reaction without being used up itself. And how does it speed it up? Well, it lowers the activation energy. Therefore, there's a faster reaction. Okay, last two parts here, and I'm going to come back to the catalyst now in a moment, is on exothermic and endothermic. Well, these two you just need to turn off. Exothermic is heat is, um, is given out to its surroundings. Okay, and then endothermic then is heat is taken in from its surroundings. People, students, teachers, we always overcomplicate these if we overthink them. So learn off the definitions and leave it at that. Now, you could argue there, if you think about this, for exothermic. This is where the confusion takes place. And hopefully this will um, try and alleviate some of us. Imagine here now, heat has been given out to its surroundings. Well, if heat has been given out to its surroundings, um, then what, it's generally going to be getting colder itself. The reaction itself is going to be getting colder because it's losing its heat. That heat has been given off to its surroundings. And then endothermic is heat has been taken into its surroundings, which means um, that the reaction itself is getting warmer. Okay, um, and I'm talking about the reaction itself now, guys, not the um, not its surroundings. That's where the, the confusion is taking place. Okay, but generally, if you just want to learn it off as these two definitions here, just leave it as that. Okay, it's not worth um, being confused over those. You do need to know the definitions, though. Now, finally, energy profile diagrams. I took these from my um from the slides in the um in the conical flask there. Okay, so you need to be able to draw one of these, and therefore you need to know what the x x and the y axis is. So x being time, and the y axis is, is energy, and that's always the same whether it's exothermic or endothermic. So if you can get that much, at least you're going to get some of the marks. Now. You'll have a line going across, and again, it doesn't matter where on the y-axis you put that line, that horizontal line going across. And again, it doesn't really matter how far you have to go over here in terms of time, okay? Unless you're told specifically, you can just make it up, okay? And again, the size of the hump here doesn't matter either, okay? Unless you're told specifically, but the, there's been no questions on that yet. You've just been told to draw it. Now, the only thing you need to note about the differences between endothermic and exothermic is the product line. Where does that fall? Well, an exothermic product line will always fall underneath the reactants, below the reactants. And then the opposite for endothermic. An endothermic um, line, product line, will always um, fall above the reactants. You need to learn that off. Okay, exo is going underneath the reactants, endo is going above the reactants. And the second thing you need to know is something called the EA. You've heard of it before. The EA stands for the activation energy, which is the minimum amount of energy colliding particles require for a successful collision to occur. So in other words, if we are to form a product here, okay, then the energy that um, this, these reactants have to have, have to hit this point over here. And likewise, same for this one over here. Okay, there is a certain energy that they have to have if they are to form the products. Okay, so that's really, really important. And you see from my EA there that I drew the lines from the reactants right up to the top, the tip top of the, um, of the slope. You're expected to do that. If you just draw it up halfway, then it's no good. You have to go right up to the top. Okay, and it's always from the reactants to the top. Um, both exothermic and endothermic, that doesn't change.
Okay, the only difference, just a reminder there, for exothermic and endothermic, is exo is below the reactants, the products are below the reactants, and endo, the products are above the reactants. I think that's this. So look, I'm going to scroll back up to the top here. So for this one here now, I've gone over briefly the chemical reactions, the gist of us, and we did an exam question that was a little bit tricky for the second part of us. Um, we discussed success with collisions, and that's the heart of us. If you can get that right, then the rest of us over here um, make sense. Hopefully it will make sense anyhow. And we went into the, um, the chemical energies side of us, and that's the exothermic and endothermic. And not to get bogged down with that, just learn off the definitions and, ter and learn off your, or understand your experiments um, and learn them off, and you'll be fine. And then the final part then was the energy profile diagram in which you need to know the similarities and the differences. Differences, Okay, there isn't, there's only one difference really. Okay, the rest of it's the same. So just to practice those and don't forget those X and Y axes. Students tend to forget drawing those. They'll know the shape, but they'll forget to, um, to label the X and Y axis. Okay, everybody, look, I hope that helped. Um, it is a challenging enough chapter, topic, I should say. Um, but if you can get it, and you can really just try your best with us, and if it, if it still doesn't make sense, leave it and then come back to us. Like, that's what chemistry is about. It's just sometimes it won't make sense. And when you come back to us, it's like you get that eureka moment. So just to take that into consideration too. Okay, everybody, best of luck with your studies.